Well, today, um, Joe's probably best known to many people for his considerable work on South American birds, but today he is going global with a talk on the shape of birds and why it matters, which I gather is based on approximately 99.7% of the extant world bird species, with most data gathered from museums, in particular the Natural History Museum. So I think that is probably enough. Before I make another error, I will hand over to Joe. <laughs> First of all, the invitation, the charming introduction. Uh, it's nice to be here in part because of the link with the uh, train Natural History Museum collection, uh, the British Ornithologist Club you know, have produced, well, the, the collection tree in particular, as Robert mentioned, uh, plays a huge, huge part in some of the research I'll be talking about today. So it's, it's nice to report on some of that. Uh, I will be talking about bird shape. It's like an old idea, really. Um, morphometrics and eco-morphology. These things people were interested in 100 years ago, 150 years ago. Um, so emblazoned by this uh, murmuration of stars and bird shape. Bird shape. Uh, some photographic competition prize winner that captures the idea of bird shape in an abstract kind of way. I will. Um, talk about uh, much more, well I'll try, it'll start off at least very non-scientific, but then I'll touch on some of the research angles that we go into in terms of basically measuring lots and lots of birds and trying to work out what that can tell us about biodiversity and ecosystems. Shape of birds, obviously, you know, we all know as naturalists or ornithologists, people that are interested in, in birds, we know that um, shape is fundamental to things like identification. These are uh, little graphics, American birds, Downy and Hairy Woodpecker, um, uh, Sharpshin and Cooper's Hawk, bird watchers, as we all know, think about gradations and nuances of shape all the time in terms of how you identify things, in proportions of the body, uh, give us a lot of information about the identity of species, whether they are species or not is one thing, but how to identify things we, um, as we go on our bird walks or whatever. Shape is a fundamental aspect of all of that. It also, I don't know, does anybody know where this picture comes from? I seem to remember seeing this when I was a child in the book. I just got it from the internet. Anybody can tell me where that comes from? It's like a gold book. I've, I've seen possibly it. possibly come from Philip Burton's monograph. Something like that. Okay, so I remember it's an old one that I saw as a child. Uh, but it captures this idea that if you understand ecomorphology, it tells us a little bit about the role of species in the ecosystem. There's obviously British waders and uh, the curly go to a greater depth than uh, many of its shorebird relatives and turnstones not going into the ground at all. So something about the beak can tell us a little bit about the ecological role. So that's not. Um, identification anymore. It's about what can shape, those shapes tell us about um, ecological attributes of species, how they function. Um, that's diet. It goes a lot deeper than that, just in terms of looking at what is called the bow plan, the body shape of birds. What can it tell us? As ornithologists, we can look at these pictures. We don't really need to know anything about these species to know that. The stilt is an aquatic species that is largely terrestrial, weighs around on its long legs. The swallow is largely aerial with its very long wings and it's almost dispensed with having legs all together. They obviously have very different lifestyles. We wouldn't need to know anything about them particularly. Somebody could show us a picture, we'd know something of their, um, of their natural history. So what I'm talking about is not uh, unfamiliar to us. It's very familiar stuff that we think about when we see species. Um, somebody, you know, people coming in, this is not my work, but people studying the relationship between how long your legs are and how long your wings are for a bird, plotting uh, a trade-off. You tend to have long legs, tarsus, etc., when you have small wings because you're more terrestrial. And here you become more aerial. There's a trade-off. You're putting your energy into developing wings but then your legs shrink, or its legs and your wings shrink. So this is coming at things from a, a more 
morphometric, uh, morphological anatomy um, kind of approach, where you see that early birds or dinosaur birds had certain attributes, and then birds radiated across a particular trade-off involving legs and wings. So that's just some science under underpinning the type of variation that we see in shapes of organisms around us. When we think about ecological niches, two of our very nicest uh, British birds, wood warbler and bullfinch, um, yeah, we all know virtually uh, from the beginning, one is an insectivore and one's a seed eater. We would know which way around that goes. It's a kind of core uh, knowledge. Yeah, obviously, the warbler with its very fine beak is designed for capturing insects. The bullfinch it's like seeds. So the beak can surely tell us a lot, like those waves that just show um, about ecological roles, the way things form their roles in the environment. How far does this go then? This is a paper from 2017 where people are trying to extend this idea, what, we, what has been termed the periodic table of niches. So this is uh, reptiles, you've got your um, horned lizard and thorny devil are a particular position. They have traits which can allow you to identify where they are in the so-called periodic table of niches. That kind of panacea is uh, something that biologists or ecologists would like to have uh, or like to be real because you know, we want to predict things about the world. It would be nice for biology, birds, uh, the world, you know, biodiversity in general to be predictive so that we can figure out a little bit how it functions in the more, you know, in the more quantitative framework. It's not always like that though. You've got quite similar species. This is a red, black and red broadbill and a toucan barbet, tropical species that if you just looked at their shape, you might think that they did the same thing. This is an insectivore and this is a frugivore. So we kind of, you come up a certain, to a certain point where this lovely, neat idea of a periodic table of niches and <laughs> bird shape being meaningful starts to fall about a bit, fall, fall apart a bit. I mean, if we did measure simply the shapes of those niches, would an analysis pull them apart to tell us that they ate different things? It's debatable whether that would be the case. Likewise, more nice bird pictures for you to look at. A, uh, a green-tailed jacamar, a gold's jewel front. Quite similar, they live side by side in Mount um, The hummingbird is obviously a nectarivore, and this is an aerial insectivore, so they do completely different things. In the, in the ecosystem. But would an analysis of their ecomorphology tell us that? It's kind of debatable that it would. They're not similar in their, in their shapes. So maybe really, you know, maybe it doesn't work that well. No such periodic table of niches uh, is found, for instance, in the honey eaters. Another very recent paper in American Naturalist. Morphological traits only explain 30% of variance in ecology, meaning diet, really, uh, of, this, of these groups. You've got some really distinctive nectarivores with long beaks, but apart from that, there wasn't really much to point to. You only get, if you, if you measure all the birds in a museum and you ask an analysis to predict what their diets are, you only get it right 37% of the time. A bit disappointing for those who want a periodic table of niches to be, um, uh, to be captured by morphometrics of bird species. Truth's probably in between those two. So uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Really. Where is it? You know, how far um, can you take this idea? And also, to begin with, why would we even want to do it? In terms of challenges and opportunities, why would we do this? We're at this point where you know, the world is changing, uh, land use change, climate change, future um, uh, distributions of biodiversity are going to be different to that which we see today. We need to understand and predict how things are going to function, how things are going to change, and having a way, a quantitative way of looking at uh, whatever organisms we're dealing with, and linking it to how things are going to function, will be useful. Lots of people have been saying functional traits, or measurements of um, specimens of one type or another, or wild organisms, will, could provide a solution if they're predictive. So the question is, how in informative are they? 
and most of the, the um, progress to date has been in plants. And this is where uh, we're getting more and more. There's an online database of, called Try. It's got half a million individual plants in there with six traits. But that's only 10% of plant diversity. These are recent papers in like the highest ranking scientific journals showing you know, the dimensionality or the variation in plant traits, like leaf, uh, area, and, uh, DPH, uh, diameter of breast height, plants. You know, botanists have been trooping around the world measuring plant traits for a long time. So this is a big compendium of those traits and how does it vary? It kind of splits out into, in, a, in one dimension where you've got woody plants and non-woody plants. But there isn't a very clear link with function. It's partly because plants are so variable. You know, within one species of plant, they vary greatly depending on where they're growing, or climate, or, you know, geology. Uh, the other problem is that we've only got, at the moment, even with such a huge investment, only 10% of plant diversity, so you can't really look at plant e um, trait evolution very well. There's too many missing species. And it doesn't predict much. There's a kind of a weak link between traits and function. So I, uh, and these are some pictures of me back in the days when I was a field ornithologist, which I definitely am not now, desk-based ornithologist uh, at this stage of my career. But like many of us at some stages, or many uh, young ornithologists at least, um, now we're in the, in, the, in the age where we haven't collected so many specimens, at least in the UK. Uh, that, isn't, that doesn't tend to be what we do so much, but measuring birds is happening at pace. It has been for a while. So I collected lots of bird traits in my field days in South America, hummingbird there, and a mock mock. Um, and many other people have been too. And some of those insights then led to big missions, which at the time, this was back, back around 2014, collecting lots of traits, both songs and beak traits for oven birds, <laughs> South American birds that vary greatly in their beak shapes. And, they're all insectivores, so that's one interesting thing. It's not telling us about their broad biological niche, ecological niche, but it can be used it to kind of explore the evolution of traits around a tree, stuff that Darwin would have found great fun. You've got an evolution of a tree for 300 and something, 350 images. You've got its beak length, its tarsus length, its song description. You see how it varies. Um, and that was, that was an early paper, which I won't go into, but just to show first steps towards what it then became, collect all the bird traits of the world. So I'm collecting song traits, of, which are very incomplete at the moment for the world's birds. But the, um, uh, the morphological traits are now nearly finished, as uh, sort of said. So over 99% of bird diversity, nine traits of all species that you can find. This is in, in Tring Museum, and have a team of people working in there taking lots of measurements. Average of five individuals per species, about 50 museums worldwide. The vast majority of specimens do come from train, but there's lots of museums involved. What's the tail length? What's the wing shape? Tarsus length and the beak dimensions. So um, this is a large data set uh, with which we can, so very much unlike the plant data set, it's almost complete. Uh, and you can start asking some interesting questions about how well it, it does. Over the last 100, 200 years, we think about body mass. That's been our kind of mainstay of ecological um, research. Uh, the kind of predictor, the trait that tells us something about the niche. It's just a single trait. It goes from bee hummingbird to ostrich, and it looks like that. Most birds are quite relatively small, with a few big ones. That's what you get with the body mass distribution. With the data that we've collected now, you can look at a big ball. This is a three-dimensional representation of those nine traits. So using a, a principal component thing, which just simplifies it to fewer dimensions. That's your ball of the birds, which tends to be a massive central ball of passerines, and then these weird things, so these peripheral things that you'd say are, are kind of bird, birds at the edge of traits. Weird birds around a, a dense ball of passerine-like things. You can slice it up in a different way to look at the beak shapes of the world. And then, of course, you've got your weird shoe bills and pelicans and sawbill hummingbirds, your weird beaks around the side, and this big ball of passerines in the middle. 
So that is the uh, so unlike plants, which separate out these two things, the bird does, the bird hyper volume is this giant ball with some weirdos creeping off at the edge. The reality, this is what the real data is, but of course we're not very good at thinking in nine dimensions. Uh, we, can, we can plot something in three dimensions and have a look at it, a kind of ball. Uh, but the real thing is it, the, the traits put into their nine dimensions and then split out to the different groups of diets. It looks like that. It's a mess, but it looks kind of groovy. Uh, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and the cool thing is that each diet has a sort of individual signature. Does the signature of its traits allow us to identify what a bird does in the way that we might like it to do, is the question. Um, and you can, it's very hard to tell from that. As I say, we're not very good at nine dimensions. Uh, you need, a, you need a, an analysis, but of course we can run analysis to say, does this data, do these data allow us to identify uh, traits of the species? So in a simple kind of framework, when you look at diets, you can split it all up into the carnivores, herbivores, piscivores, nectarivores, simple dietary framework, and then plot those diets on the big ball of traits. And the remarkable thing is, what well, was remarkable to me, I mean, I've always known that, as, we, as I say, we all know that traits are something. I thought it was going to be a bit messier than it actually was, then. Things do separate out. There's partitioning where your nectarivores are up in one corner and your scavengers are off in another. And, um, <clears throat> there are some difficult groups like frugivores and insectivores that are quite overlapping. But in general, things are partitioned out giving us a clue that it's quite informative. If we go back to body size, which is what we've been working on for the last 200 years, and we ask body size to predict what things do in those, in those groups, omnivore, carnivore, scavenger, whatever, we do very badly. Blue means bad, red means we've got a lot of them right. The only one that we do very reasonably well with is hummingbirds, because they're just so small. Uh, body size tells us a little bit about whether you're likely to be a hummingbird or not. If you just ask body size to identify your dietary niches of birds, you get it right 25% of the time, which isn't that much more than you get just by, just by random. So body size is informative. We've used it for a long time, but it's actually pretty well, which is predictive. If you throw in beak in there, you start getting the pattern. This would be, you know, so this is of actual versus expected. If you want to get if you're getting it right 100 percent of the time, you just have reds across this diagonal. So um, with size and beacon, you start doing a lot better. You get hummingbirds because you've got their small size and the beak. You're getting it right almost all the time. Um, so this is just a, a way of thinking about how traits can improve our ability to work out or be predictive about ecological roles. If you use the whole phenotype, you start doing pretty well. Omnivores, you do badly and unsurprisingly because they're sort of probably in between different groups. So you don't do so well with those. But over 75% correct with those traits. That's way better than I thought it was going to be. You measure nine traits of birds, you put it into analysis and ask it what the bird eats. You get it right 75% of the time. It's not perfect. Of course it wouldn't be because of all these weirdos and uh, omnivores and things. But that's pretty good in terms of a predictive framework. A lot better than we've been using for the last 200 years anyway. Um, we can also say, how well do we do? These are the different groups, and how much more, how much your accuracy increases with the number of traits or dimensions you add to it. Uh, you find that you do adding traits gets you better and better. Normally, it's body size down here, so body size will get you to like 20, 25 percent. And then you add more traits, and up to about five or sometimes six, depending on which group. And then it levels off. So this is an interesting way of looking at it. We need, in terms of our traits and diets, dietary niches. Five or six traits to be able to tell us. After that, we get very little improvement in how well we predict them. So we just want to kind of get that known. We've moved further from that into not just simple dietary traits, but thinking about what birds do. So this is just insectivores, but the last thing that I showed you was just how do you identify an insectivore? Of course, insectivores include woodpeckers and swallows and some waders and uh, antipitters or whatever. It's a big mixed bag of things, which is, again, not too surprising to get things wrong in that case. 
we split out all the diets into their kind of subgroups of ways of doing it, aerial screening or, or diving insectivores or terrestrial insectivores. Um, when we're just thinking about body size, we get almost everything wrong. It doesn't tell us much about foraging strategy of birds. When we're thinking three dimensions, like shape of the cube, we do, we do a lot better. Um, but when we go further along, that accumulation of, you know, we need five or six to get things right. When we have five or six, in, when we have six dimensions in there, we're identifying the world's birds to their foraging strategy, like the, not just their diet, but the way they do it. Um, with you know, the, red, the red being good accuracy, the blue being rubbish. So again, it's not just to do with, you know, it, it, you can, it, it can go quite nuanced in terms of what it tells us about the structure and functioning of bird diversity. So that's just a, um, uh, an encouraging, you know, it's not a periodic table of niches you can say, but it's approaches it in places that can be a quantitative framework that we can use. These are the different uh, groups of birds, uh, scavengers and insectivores or whatever, uh, and the different regions, so the Neotropics and the Palearctic and, the, uh, and Asia, are all identifiable as scavengers. This is just, how repeatable is this? In different parts of the world, being a nectarivore, you kind of end up in the same, it's like you've, you've moved towards the same um, area of morphospace. Of course, maybe it's all because you've got shared ancestry, so we can't call it convergence, but at least it shows that there's sort of targets in that ball, there are certain targets that you move towards if you're a bird, like the bullfinch going with its big beak towards being uh, a granivore. Granivores. This is granivores, pigeons, uh, whereas the warbler moves up there with its thinner beak. So there are targets that they're going for that are predicted. I'm going to go through some, I did all the nice pictures at the beginning and now it's all graphs, sorry. Um, <laughs> but they're quite interesting, hopefully. Um, there, there are different ways of getting to that target. Uh, you can just be there because you were always there and didn't really change much. That's stasis. You just kind of hung out there. Um, and some groups are like that. We, we found, we used uh, this kind of statistical technique to pull out the most similar families um, with, of diets, so we had data of 200 families, and, it pulled, and then we were able to look at the evolutionary history, because of course with the, we've got a phylogeny of all the birds of the world, so this is not just a ball of dots, it's a ball of dots that you can trace the evolutionary history through, which is pretty <laughs> far out. Um, but these are the, uh, the whistlers and the virionids, and they have very similar traits. They've got very similar traits because they haven't moved for ages. They're not convergent on a particular thing. They're static. They're an example of what we might call stasis. It's quite hard to pin these down in terms of definitions, but when you use an arbitrary definition, you can define stasis, and these are static. If you look at the graph at the top, they haven't changed much over millions of years, since 100 million years ago. They've just been like that. Um, that is rather different from things like hornbills and toucans, which do something a bit different, they've moved a longer distance. Since they last shared a common ancestor, they've moved quite a long way, but they've moved together, which we, which you can't call so much classic convergence. It's not like they were way different and then came together, but they've, they've sort of traveled through ecological space in a parallel way. They started out over here, their ancestors, and then they traveled through trait space to their frugivorous big beakness together, but apart. It's interesting that that happened. So you wouldn't call them, you know, people talk about them as being convergent, but it's a certain type of convergence. They went there together rather than being very different in their evolutionary past. The more classic idea of an, uh, an, um, a shared ancestor that then evolved differences and then came back together, uh, with this kind of pattern, does occur. And you can see the grey bits on the top are where traits are predicted through what we call ancestral reconstructions, to be different in their evolutionary history. They became different and then they came back together. And there's probably a lot of ecology in that. So these ant pitters and pitters, they shared ancestors back here in the middle of the passerine tree, and then they went through, they went into quite different areas before they converged, presumably because they became forest 
terrestrial insectivores, and they, they develop the same traits. But they went a different route. So that's more like classic convergence ideas. Swifts and swallows, likewise, they had ancestors not far apart. They, they, well, they shared ancestors long ago, uh, whatever, hummingbird-like, you know, or way back before that, to their shared ancestors. And then they went through very different trajectories. They became hugely different before coming back together, presumably when they both evolved aerial insectivity. So convergence is happening, but it's not all the time. Those are examples of things that we identify as very similar in their traits, but they had a very different evolutionary history, which you can now map through this ball of dots and create. When you look at the work, the, these 200 families that are paired, stasis, not really moving, explains less than a quarter. More than 75% of cases of similarity are some kind of convergence. Most of it's just because they've kind of gone together. There's only about a quarter of cases where, that are textbook you know, examples of convergence. So that might surprise some people is too low or some other people is too much, but that's what we find in our case. Convergent evolution has created this predictive framework, but not all of the time. Uh, very briefly, because I know this is all numbers, but it was interesting to me, like the classic idea of convergence is it would happen if you're ecologically similar, but you don't live together, so you're not competing. Um, and this uh, parallel and classic convergence is far more common if you live apart. You have no overlap. If you have range overlap, you tend not to converge. It makes sense, like the ant pitters and pitters, they're doing the same thing in different parts of the world. So that answers one question. And then if your niches are very similar, that also predicts so. If you've got different niches, you don't tend to converge, but most of that convergence is happening if you've got the same niche, but you live apart. It kind of makes sense. You might have argued that in the pub, but it's nice to be able to look at the bird tree and say, there it is, there's the pattern that people have thought about. Um, and, and also to see how prevalent it is. It's not everything. It's a bit of it, but it's quite a good chunk. Two thirds, three quarters or so of things show convergence, and it's where you would expect it to be. How long have I droned on for? Do I have a, uh, a little bit more time to be able to? You do indeed have some more time. Keep going. How long have you I would suggest uh, 15 or so minutes. 15? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is just a few kind of examples. I'm not going to go into uh, detailed research, but just some. <laughs> Uh, examples of touching on things that are, that are related to this research and what, it's, what it's, might be useful for, applications of it. This is to mention to Nigel, my good friend from Berlin, who said he was going to come along tonight, but of course he's not here. Uh, um, with Nigel Cora, I worked on the Red Data books of Berlin like, during my time there, and then have been involved uh, with um, BirdLife's taxonomic uh, guidelines. Um, producing, using traits, and including plumage traits, and including some a kind of taxonomic guideline that you can use these traits for. You need more than five individuals per species, but you can start to split things like they are doing with Tenerife and Grand Canaria, Blue Chaffinch. You know, to link it to sister species that occur together, work out how different you should be, to then predict how, how different you would like things to be to be to justify treatment as a species if they occur apart. I don't want to go into that, which is to say, uh, I'm sometimes known for this taxonomic guideline stuff, and it does relate to these traits, but it's just not the main focus of them uh, at the moment. So no need to actually go into any of the stuff behind that. Where my research is more focused nowadays is about understanding ecosystems, interactions, how they function. And for that, we'd like to know stuff about birds and maybe you know, connections with things that depress their um, populations. I haven't got human beings in this one. Um, uh, but predation, disease, are uh, things that push bird populations down. And you've got these positive interactions because birds play an important role in mutualistic networks with uh, as seed dispersers and, uh, and pollinators. So those are, that's some of the workings of ecosystems that are interesting, and they, they themselves control populations of insects. So we call this kind of tritrophic interactions, and an important one is the non-trophic one, bird-to-bird -bird competition. In all of these ways, 
We're trying to use these traits to kind of explore some of the structural underpinnings of those interactions. Uh, the first one, um, I'll just give an example of interspecific, or like within trophic guilds, the competition that, um, uh, that occurs between birds is of interest. I think it will pick that. So using, using those oven bird traits early on, uh, birds normally, bird species arise in allopatry separately, and then they, they evolve to be sympatric, to coexist. So we did this study to look at how competition affects that process of being sympatric, the transition to being sympatric. And you can use the phylogenies that we have available to say how long have these things occurred separately, how long ago did they speciate, and then you can say how overlapping are their ranges. And then you can also say how close are they ecologically, by like looking at their, their traits. What you find is that there's a kind of lag, or there's quite good evidence of some kind of lag that you might expect if they're competing. They come back together and they don't overlap. And in part, the theory goes that they compete. So you don't get that so much in Europe, but in South America, you know, the tropical regions, you get quite a few species that occur. In country, um, their, their ranges will be contiguous uh, and they can't live together because they're competing. Very briefly, we find that there's some kind of lag to four million years before um, these oven birds in South America tend to live together. Presumably, or we assume there's some competitive process before that. Interestingly, we find that this is uh, affected by their beak shapes. So they tend to be more likely to live together when they're young if their beaks are quite different. Yeah. <clears throat> that should theoretically relax competition. Um, when their beaks are similar, it takes them you know, a long time, up to eight million years, they can't, they can't get back together. If their beaks are very similar, and they're doing a very similar thing in the, in the environment, that slows down how quickly they can live together. Don't need to really get into that, but the important thing is you, that you can use traits to predict whether things can move together. And if you think about it, under climate change, birds are going to move around a lot. It's useful to have a trait-based uh, um, framework with which we could, that, could, that might be able to help us predict the winners and losers of that process. Who's going to be able to live together or not, particularly in a tropical system. And we do stuff in my group uh, looking at this thing, um, all, these, all these interactions, but I'll show some data from the traits and seed dispersal. So this would be, all, this is data from all the 2,700 plus frugivorous species, or seed dispersive species of birds. So we can, you know, we kind of know what they like um, from hornbills down to tiny things and using bird community data with presence absence or abundance from deforested landscapes, we can have a look at how the structure changes from an intact system to a non-intact. So just as an example, uh, this is like in, in Amazonia, across lots of watersheds, from pristine Amazonian rainforest to quite trashed Amazonian rainforest. You get this kind of pattern there. If you look at all the, the seed-eating birds, you've got this signature of what a healthy system should look like in morpho space, as we call it, and then how it, how it um, uh, declines with di disturbance and then collapses in you know, agricultural landscape. So you lose your seed dispersal service of birds. And you can, we kind of knew that by which species were missing, but now we can see some, um, you know, it gives us some shape or quantitative measure of what we are losing in terms of the diversity of traits. There's lots of evidence that what your beak is like as a, as a seed, seed disperser for food or tells you quite a bit about what seeds you're eating. So do some research on how that changes and measuring lots of seeds as well to see how these things lead to that. So that's why I'm all that some of the research is going into more related to ecosystem function. That's just an example of if we have this semi-periodic table of niches from um, uh, specimens measured in museums around the world, what can we do with it? It's a framework for understanding we have biodiversity, how it's where it came from, and how it's structured, what it will be like in future. 
community ecology, uh, macroevolution and macroecology. So having, tra having traced for such a large proportion of species, plus biologically, it allows us to test all sorts of things about how those traits evolve over time, etc. Conservation priority setting, ecological forecasting, like I mentioned in terms of range shifts with, with climate change, working out who will be able to live together or not. And then apply, various supply projects that we're working on, landscape management and uh, how, we can, how future ecosystems will function. So it's just a, um, interesting that bird traits is this quite old um, ornithological Field that people measuring and trying to interpret traces moved on hopefully to this situation where we've got traces from the world's birds and we might have to do quite a lot with it. We're hoping to uh, develop this as a big trait database in, in communication with the Natural History Museum, hoping to get it through the portal, uh, data portal of the Natural History Museum. It's quite London based in terms of uh, a lot of the work that's going on, but we're, we work closely with people like Gavin Thomas in Sheffield. Who's, doing lots of really big scanning and other people who are collecting very nice trade data sets. So early stages but we're in the, in the next year or two and hopefully put together a big compendium of bird traits that will be then open uh, for researchers to use. And that's a picture of um, it's not all but some of the museums that have been involved just to get across the uh, the large task of pulling some of these things together and people who have um, contributed trip data from uh, from all over the world. So it's quite an exciting project which I hope has a useful future. Thanks for listening. That's it for now.